YOLO composing gloves here, and today we're looking at the analog module inside of Faceplant. It is the core of a lot of the sounds we're going to be making. Here's a sound that I made with Faceplant. I've got a couple here to show you real quick to sort of entice you to learn about the module and its abilities. This sync knob is fascinating to me. It's an amazing knob to mess with. So let's go ahead. Let me show you this crazy sound. I'm going to play some low notes. I'm just holding down one note right now. So there's a random module in here that I'm letting do its thing. That's what's causing this motion. We can bump it up a bit, you know? So I could take this macro two and pop it up. It's controlling the sync here. So we can do some nifty things with the macro. So I really like this sound. It's got that nice gurgly motion formancy neuro -y stuff to it. I enjoy that. All right, now uh, I have another sound here. Uh, this one's inspired by AU5. We were talking on a Discord server. And on this Discord server, we were talking about uh, Disperser and some things. And he described one of the sounds I made as boiling plastic. And it, it just fit really well. And so I've been thinking about that ever since. Ironically, this is a completely different sound. But it's a really interesting way to describe a sound. So here's what this one sounds like. Uh, this is very gurgly. I have them play monophonic, so I can still play notes after that craziness. We can adjust the glide time. Very nice, very nice. And of course, not all in life is bass, although some would have you believe that. We have some nicer sounds out there in the universe. Not that those were mean. They were just, you know, a little crazy. Oh, I have this flute sound. Let's play some higher notes here. And I've got some macros here, but for this one, I've got a little... A little thingy I played on the keyboard and just recorded it and I brought in some automation afterwards uh, just to show off what this can do and this one is specifically moving the sync knob around you see both one controls the brings it down and the other brings it up and they produce some really interesting textures uh, let me just go ahead and play it for you Very nice, very nice, very cool. So this is these are fun sounds. I really like these. They're very pleasant. Now, you may have noticed in all of these patches, there is uh, quite a bit going on here. It's not just analog. This is a blank one. Uh, but, and also, I have to comment this. It is awesome how fast and snappy this is. Oh my gosh, watch. Let me click, let me click contact here. And ready, click. Wait for it. Wait for it. There it is. <laughs> That's ridiculous, man. So I, every time I click this, I just appreciate how much is going on, and it's still a bazillion times faster. So, okay, very interesting. We're going to just talk about the analog module here. If you're interested in the other sounds, I can do separate videos for those. But right now, we're going to master one thing at a time, bro, man, dude. We'll just give examples of things being used as we go along here. So let's go ahead and put an analog module down. And we see these other things pop up, which is, we talked about that in the other video. They're necessary to get the sound out. And if we play it, we have a sawtooth. And that could, we can make some cool music with that. Uh, now, in here, we can see our waveform. Very cool. We could pick like a square wave. We have a triangle wave. Just like a, a toned down version of a square wave. Sound and synth basics, you know that they have very similar harmonic structures. And then we have just a pure frequency, a sine wave. Very cool, very cool. Now let's go ahead and just go down the line here. Now, first up at the beginning, we have amplitude. We have our level. 
I'm pointing this out in this way, I don't know, because I'm just starting there, but also because I'm always looking for this as a dang knob. I'm always over here looking for some volume knob and it's not there, it's over here. And it's funny because when I want to modulate this, I know exactly where it's at, but when I want to turn it up or down, I always think of a knob. It's driven me nuts. I've actually got patches where I've loaded in mix, uh, mix controls, not for gain staging, but simply because I forgot that there was a volume knob there. So uh, anyways, volume. And a lot of times you won't have an output stage for some of these things and you'll still want to control their level over time. So if you want to do that, you can come down to the modulators and load up an envelope. Let's bring the attack out and we can modulate the level. We'll bring it down. Let's bring our attack out a bit more. And we're able to control it like that. So that's a nifty way of doing that. I'm going to get rid of it. But there you go. That's a, that's a super common thing you're going to want to do. We also have our tuning, and there's a bunch of tuning options. You might go, why are there so many? It's because each one tunes differently, and when you modulate them, they are going to produce super different effects. Sometimes they'll vary off into wildly different modulations than you initially expected. So first we have our semitone and scent tuning. So semitones like we, as notes. Very nice. Double click to reset stuff. And we have sense, which is basically very fine tuning. Very cool. So for example, I could have another analog oscillator. Let's make it a sine wave and I can modulate this. Green means we can modulate something at the audio rate. And so I could modulate, for example, the level. We can hear its effect. We'll talk more about these sorts of moves later. I could modulate the semitone. You can get some really nifty effects. You can't mess with the harmonics. So let's look at the harmonics here. So if I play a note, it looks like a regular tune knob, but then we can move up in the harmonic spectrum. And I, uh, while you cannot do an audio rate modulation, if memory serves, I always just sort of test it out to see if it works out. Yeah, you can mess with it with a, um, a modulator. Wow, that took me a sec. Uh, so what we could do here is check this out. We could get like an LFO, and this would sound cool if we slow it like way down. And we give it some modulation over this, and we play a note. And actually, you know what would be a bit cooler? Let's get um, a random, and this is going to sort of jump around to random harmonics. Could be really cool to generate nifty control signals. You saw the use of randomization in the first bass patch that I showed you. Let's speed it up, yeah. Let's dial back how far it can go. But anyways, there you get an idea. Uh, random is a really interesting one to throw into patches to cause movement. Uh, we have shift, and this is like tuning, except for it's an offset in hertz. And we can, of course, do some FM, or yeah, in this case, it is FM. Very nice. And we have phase, and now we have phase, uh, phase modulation, very similar to frequency modulation. Very cool. There are technical differences. Uh, I have a, a video on it uh, that actually goes through the math of it if you're interested in my FM series. And then we have our, so we have our wave shapes and that is that. So, okay, let's move along over here to these interesting buttons here. So we have sync and sync is an old term for analog. It comes from the analog land. So back in the day when you had a, you know, an oscillator, You'd, it'd be a circuit, like a physical circuit with electrons flying around, causing your oscillation with your, com with your components. The problem was, uh, since that's, you know, physics, there are a whole bunch of other factors that physically affect it, such as temperature and whatnot, and it causes your stuff to go out of tune pretty quick. So what they did, so if you had like two, two oscillators, what they tend to just, you know, drift away from each other. And it became a problem. Like you'd be playing one second and the first tune would be nice. And then you'd, and the next tune would be like, you know, off. And that's enough to really screw with things later on down the line. So what they did was they said, hey, let's set up 
that so that when this when a master one, so we define one oscillator to be like the master, and then when it crosses zero, so like here and here and here, it's going to reset the phase of the other waveform at zero. And so, or just at some point. And what that has the effect of is it causes it to restart. And instead of it sounding like it's gone out of tune, it sounds like a texture change. That was the, so people began to use this for sound design and it became a, a real big thing. You'll see a sync on a lot of um, oscillators, especially a lot of synthesizers, especially if they are emulators. So let's go ahead and just turn this up here and you see a wave will begin to appear at the midpoints right where they crossed zero. And the way this works is it increases the frequency of this. So if we go to the point where they like stack up, you'll basically get a frequency of twice. And then this just keeps going. And this can have some really cool effects when it comes to modulation and the way you use it. So let's go ahead, let's just get an LFO on this and just mess with this a bit. We already are getting some nice, some nice leads. We could do it with any waveform. So where they cross zero, they split. And it defines this in the manual that actually calls this first one, the fundamental one, the normal frequency. And this just means that the first waveform, this initial one, is the one where it defines where these splits happen and where the sync will occur. And in a lot of sounds, actually, that is what I'm messing with. Like, if I come over here to this... No, not this one. Where's the other one? Holy crap, let's play some lower notes. Let's go to the Neurobase Revenge. That's what's moving around. Like, every time you hear that, like, cool movement upwards, that's what's changing. Check that out. So that's uh, a, a use of it right there. So let's go back to our first one. So many phase plants. All right, so there you go. That's one quick example. That's what sync does. We also have PW, which you'll see this everywhere as well. This is pulse width, and you can expect a square wave to activate it. The others don't get it because they ain't square waves, and it just changes the pulse. And this is super classic as well. We could throw down a, uh, let's throw down an LFO for this. Keep getting rid of the LFO and bringing it back. If you play it really low. And we could give it a chorus, or over here we have a unison. We could drag that up. Come on, unison, work with me here. There we go, click drag. Get a nice, a nice sound. So we'll go ahead, we'll get rid of this. So what is the deal with unison? Well, oh, I changed my pulse width to zero. That ain't gonna work out. Let's go to like a, a saw wave and let's bring sync down. All right, so the way unison works is unison will clone the voice. So there's an independent voice and there is a difference between this unison and this unison. So this unison is a lot more CPU efficient, but it's got some boundaries uh, where this one doesn't. So let's, let's look at this one first. So right now when I hit, when I hit it and it's on one, I wonder if it goes down to zero. I've never tried. Nope, stays at one. It's generating one saw wave. So every time I hit a note, it generates that one saw wave. Now, if I put it on two, it's going to generate two saw waves, and these saw waves will be a little bit off in things like uh, tuning. That Well, just tuning. It's just going to move it off. That's why we have a detune here. So if detune is zero, there'll be... Uh, they'll have a static phase relationship because they'll be playing the same frequency. One will be just shifted a little bit uh, phase-wise. And when I say phase shifted, let's just move the phase here. It has the effect of just sliding the waveform. That's what phase shifted means. So we see it's just been slid over here. There's a second one that's been slid over. If we do three, there's three, and they've been slid over by different amounts. And this detune controls the tuning relationship between the two. Spread controls uh, stereo width, so how it pushes out in the spectrum. This can be important later on if you have like heavy distortion processing. Often spread can really change how the interaction happens. Sometimes it makes things sound more blurry than I'd like. And other times it makes it sound 
uh, too sharp, so I'll come to spread and see if that does anything. So you can hear the one over here and the one over here a little bit more clearly. If we really detune it. They begin to merge a little bit. Now if we bring this up past two, we start getting the blend option. So the blend option, what its job is, is it deals with the things in the middle and the things on the side. So if you have it all the way up, we get a really wide image. If you bring it down, it becomes very mono. It's just a balance between those, hence blend. Now, why is this one so much more CPU efficient? Well, it's a little technical at this point because we haven't talked about the poly button, but if we generate some effects over here and do things to our signal, I don't know, let's slap a chorus on there. It's taking our unison voices and summing them into one big voice, and then that gets pushed through the lanes. However, if we use unison, so if I push, well, let me explain this. If I push two notes, it's going to get shoved into one sort of big note, if that's how you want to think about it. And that gets pushed through all these effects. But if I bring this unison up, this will generate a unique note. It's like a, a completely separate thing that gets processed separately. And that can give us some really cool powers. But at the same time, it also eats CPU. So if we were to bring this way up, see it's got the same controls, and then play a note. I'm at 21 right now. Let's let's see how much we can break this. So we jump up to 61, and we haven't even touched the poly buttons yet. Oh my gosh. So there's there we'll talk about these later, but if we turn these on, it's gonna get even better. Uh, let's throw some effects down. Oh my goodness. Uh, the gate, that's a stupid effect to put on right now. Let's grab something that's going to make a difference. Uh, the gates are cool, just it's not going to make a difference here. Let's put a distortion on there. One. Can't even handle a, a chord. So you want to be careful with this. You're going to want to grab this when you know why you're grabbing it and use it uh, sparsely. So it can handle some lower voices. Just uh, watch, watch your back there. So this is, yeah, per note, un unique uniqueness going on all right cool so we've gone over this gone over that that is pretty much the analog section if you have any questions about this let me know uh let me go through and show you sort of how i used it in the patches yeah that way we get some ideas what's going on here so okay up here is a bunch of jargon with noise you can ignore the noise stuff it's what makes it sound like someone's blowing over like the flute's mouthpiece or something and I didn't go for like an accurately modeled flute. Obviously, I, I called it square flute. It's going after, it just has the qualities. Oh, it reminds me of a flute. And over here is what we've got going on. You notice I have some very light modulations. A lot of these are test modulations and I wound up just leaving them there. But small amounts, like 5%, can sometimes be quite significant. Like let's try moving a couple of these. So there you go. Now, if you want to reset a value to something specific, like I want 5%, we can do that by right-clicking and go back to 5%. So we have shift and phase. These are both different kinds of modulation. And then our expression up down, this is going to push the sync. And right, the sync defines at that split at the original frequency. So I've sort of faked playing a higher frequency here by pushing the sync up. And I've tried to get it to where it looks like a continuous waveform at, at some ratio of the original. And if I change that, we get all these really unusual looks, looksies in the middle. If we play a really low note. Like who would have thought that'd come out of a, a flute patch? It almost gives it like a more exotic appeal. So this one's pulling the sink down and we can of course push it up. And then I forgot what I was, oh, I hooked it up to the resonator, that's right. And I believe this goes to the note, note depth over here. Ah, yeah. So this is a little more complicated. It is unrelated to the analog, uh, but also I actually make a note of this. If you wanna get rid of those those plips and plops, which I think are cool, but you might not. All you got to do is just get rid of the note, 
this uh, here note LFO. So if I just were to get rid of it, all those plips and plops go away. Some people like that more. I personally like it with this. It adds a little more interest to me. It's of course gonna depend on what I'm using it for though. Here I'm just sort of making something that sounds cool. But there's an example, that's the triangle wave. I, I didn't like what this, these other waves were had too many upper harmonics that were getting in the way. And the sine wave is also cool. But I liked how the harmonics merged with some of the effect processing I'm doing over here. So I wound up settling on the triangle wave. If you have any questions about this module, let me know. Subscribe and have a blessed day.